Here we've reached the end of our discussion on the respiratory system. We started off looking at the anatomy, the conductive versus the respiratory portions of the, of the respiratory tract. We discussed the three-dimensional movements of the diaphragm and the rib cage to get an understanding on how we can ventilate air into and out of the lungs. And lastly, we have to look at gas exchange. Once we get the air into and out of the alveolar sacs exchange with the environment, how do we get exchange of oxygen and carbon dioxide across the wall of that respiratory membrane? And also, we, we have to understand that we don't just get gases exchanged at the alveolar sac. We also get them exchanged at the capillaries because any oxygen we pick up at the lungs, we're going to want to carry to and drop off at the tissues where we can pick up carbon dioxide and bring that back to the lungs to expel it out of the body. So there has to be gaseous movement across the epithelial linings at both the lungs and at the tissue level. And then lastly, we'll wind up talking about the hemoglobin and how hemoglobin is going to be used to transport gases uh, throughout the body, oxygen and carbon dioxide. So looking at the alveolar sac, this was the end of our anatomical discussion with regard to the, the respiratory tract. We had our trachea dividing into two main bronchi, which then divided up into lobar bronchi and subsequently divided up into segmental bronchi and bronchioles and terminal bronchioles. And we had respiratory bronchioles. Then we finally had the alveolar ducts. And at the end was this sac-like alveoli. This is where we see vascularity surround those sacs and we can get a proper piece of anatomy for exchange of gases with the environment. In the alveolar sacs we have two different types. We re reviewed this already. We have our type 1 alveolar cells which are going to be responsible for the surface in which gases pass through and we had our type 2 alveolar cells secreting a surfactant which will line the inside of that alveolar sac to minimize any chance that we will get a collapse, decrease in the surface tension on, on, this, on that alveoli. So we're going to be looking for gases to go from the air that we just breathed in, or oxygen at least anyway, across the respiratory membrane and into the blood, while we'll see carbon dioxide moving in the opposite direction. The respiratory membrane gets to be important because we have to picture we've got two different epithelial linings taking part. On one hand, we have our type 1 alveolar cells, simple squamous epithelial tissue. And we have the epithelial cells making up the wall of the capillary. Now, way back when we did diffusion, we talked about distance traveled being an important variable when it comes to diffusion rate. The farther something has to diffuse, the longer it's going to take. That should make perfect sense. Now, we eliminated that as a variable when we talked about diffusion in A and P1. Because at that time, we were only discussing diffusion and how it applied to exchange into and out of a cell. And if we're talking about moving solutes into and or out of a cell, the distance that has to be traveled is the thickness of the plasma mem membrane. And because of that, and we won't see plasma membranes vary in thickness to any great extent, that was not a variable that we needed to concern ourselves with at that point. That distance became a standard, a non-variable when it comes to diffusion into or out of the cell. But if we were talking about diffusion in a pitcher of water with Kool-Aid crystals, or if we're talking about diffusion across a more tissuous membrane, now distance certainly does come into play. And if we want to have readily transportable gases at a high rate across our alveolar cell wall, 
then we are going to need the thinnest respiratory membrane possible. We accomplish that by attaching the wall of the alveoli and the wall of the capillary together with a basement membrane. Without that basement membrane anchoring the two, we would see the potential for the alveolar wall and the capillary wall to drip further apart. I mean, when we look at the structure of that respiratory membrane, being those three components, we still have certain parts of it that are going to be unvariable. The thickness of the alveolar wall is going to be a constant. That is the thickness of a simple squamous epithelial cell. That dimension is unchangeable. Likewise, with the dimension of the capillary epithelial cells, that distance is somewhat unvariable and a constant. So the only place we've got the opportunity to increase or decrease the thickness of our respiratory membrane is going to be at the potential space that lies in between those two layers of epithelium. The basement membrane anchoring the epithelial walls of both the alveolar sacs and the capillary minimizes the thickness of the respiratory membrane making diffusion of gases across that membrane as efficient and as high rate as possible. So we have to include, we have gas exchange at the lungs. So this is the gas exchange that most people are readily familiar with. You're exchanging gases with the air that you're ventilating into and out of the lungs. You're breathing in air rich in oxygen, absorbing that oxygen across the respiratory membrane. Carbon dioxide moves in the opposite direction and when you exhale and expel that air out, you're exhaling carbon dioxide rich air. You've consumed the oxygen in the air you breathe in and you've replaced it with carbon dioxide that you're about to breathe out. But we will also get gases exchanged at the tissue level. We need to get oxygen out of the blood and into the tissue where the cells can use it. And we have to be able to pick up carbon dioxide that's produced in the tissues, get it back in the blood so we can transport it all the way back to the lungs so therefore we can expel it. Now when talking about this particular exchange, we're going to use terms that relate to pressure. Millimeters of mercury. Now to simplify this, I want to put it in a bit of a context from the other types of diffusion that we've discussed. When we talked about diffusion across the cell wall, we talked about it, we talked about sodium and potassium and, and, and those sorts of solutes, non-gaseous solutes. For those, we always use the term concentration. And we had our basic rule of diffusion that says, Solutes will always diffuse from a high concentration to a low concentration along that concentration gradient. Well, all we're really doing here from a practical standpoint is changing the terminology. The concept remains the same. Rather than use the word concentration now, we use the term partial pressure. Just because we're talking about gases. Rather than say the solutes will diffuse along their concentration gradient from a high concentration to a low. Now we're going to be using the terms of gases will diffuse from a high partial pressure to a low along their partial pressure gradient. Concept is the same, just want you to be aware of where we get these pressure uh, terms from. It's not a whole new concept. We've studied this before with diffusion. We're just using terminology that's specific for gases, not just any solute. We tend to see the concentration, if you will, the partial pressure of oxygen in the air that you breathe in, atmospheric oxygen, to be at about 100 millimeters per mercury. So this would be the pressure of the oxygen inside the alveolar sac based on the air you just inhaled. At that point, we know that the blood returning to the lungs is low oxygen blood. The pressure of oxygen in that blood happens to be about 
40 millimeters of mercury. There is our pressure gradient. From 100 down to 40, we will see oxygen move from the alveolar sac and into the blood because we have our partial pressure of oxygen here at 100 millimeters of mercury. We've got the partial pressure of oxygen in the blood at about 40 millimeters of mercury and we move from a high concentration of oxygen to use that old term again, a high partial pressure of oxygen across our respiratory membrane and into the blood where the partial pressure of oxygen happens to be lower. And by doing so, as blood comes by the alveolar sac, it picks up oxygen from the air you just breathe in, and now you've enriched that blood with oxygen that can be carried off, from, well, first back to the heart, but then out into the tissues as part of that systemic circulation. We see the same thing happen, well not the same thing exactly, an opposite thing happen with carbon dioxide. At the lungs, the air you just breathed in that also had the 100 millimeters of mercury of oxygen has about 40 millimeters of mercury of carbon dioxide. However, the blood at that point we know is deoxygenated blood, it's carrying more carbon dioxide the pressure of carbon dioxide in the blood at that point is 45 millimeters of mercury. Same principle though, we will see gases move from a high partial pressure to a low. So this time, now that we're just talking about the carbon dioxide, we will see the air in the alveoli at about 40 millimeters of mercury of carbon dioxide. In the blood, we have about 45 millimeters of mercury of carbon dioxide. Gas has always moved from high partial pressure to a low. This time, in the context of carbon dioxide, we will move from the blood, across the respiratory membrane, and into the alveolar sac. And now when you breathe out, that carbon dioxide gets expelled out into the atmosphere. So we see this bidirectional exchange where carbon dioxide is going to leave the blood and enter the alveolar sac. Oxygen is going to leave the alveolar sac and it's going to enter the blood. Now, we will see a concept come up here a little bit later about Dalton's Law. Dalton's Law basically suggests that in a mixture, each gas will behave independently and move along its own partial pressure gradient as if the other gases weren't present. So when we say we have oxygen moving from the alveolar sac and into the blood, and we have carbon dioxide leaving the blood and going into the alveolar sac, that is not a trade. There is no transporter in here that's regulating movement across that membrane from the sense of ooh, one carbon dioxide leaves, now one oxygen can enter. We have no trade. Oxygen is transported into the blood as if it was the only gas present, based only on its concentration or partial pressure gradient. Likewise, carbon dioxide moves across this membrane as if it's the only gas present. The transport of one does not impact the transport of another. And that is why before we're done we will introduce buffers again and we will talk about changes in respiratory rate And how if we took someone from sea level and put them in Colorado at a much higher altitude, their red blood cell capacity is going to be low for that environment. In order to get the amount of oxygen they need out of the oxygen poor air, they need to breathe at an increased rate. Well, from a standpoint of kind of what goes up has to come down, every time you breathe in, you have to breathe out. 
and if you are increasing your rate just to meet your oxygen demand, every time you breathe out, you are going to be expelling excess carbon dioxide, which can go on to alter the pH of the blood. By the time we get to the tissues, our partial pressures are now reversed. At the lungs, we had a high partial pressure of oxygen in the alveolar sac. We had a high partial pressure of carbon dioxide in the blood, and they moved in their respective directions. At the tissues, roles are reversed. The high concentration of oxygen now happens to be in the capillary with a low partial pressure of oxygen in the tissues because it's being consumed out there. Similarly, carbon dioxide is produced in the tissues. Therefore, the high partial pressure of carbon dioxide is going to be outside the capillary this time, and we will get carbon dioxide movement from the interstitial fluid of the tissues across the capillary wall and into the blood. So now that we've looked at gas exchange across both of those membranes in the body, now we can look at how it's transported from one place to another. How does it get picked up at the lungs and dropped off at the tissues, or if, we're, if it's oxygen, or vice versa if we're talking about carbon dioxide? Well, first off, carbon dioxide is very poorly soluble. Only about 1.5% of all your inspired oxygen is dissolved directly in the blood plasma. Because of this, we need to have some sort of transport mechanism, and we find that transport mechanism in hemoglobin, a protein-based component in the red blood cells with an oxygen or a, a, an iron group attached and four binding sites for oxygen. If we picture hemoglobin as being divided up into its four binding sites, we see a phenomena where when we get an oxygen bound to the first binding site, the affinity for attaching oxygen increases for the second binding site. So as soon as we get an oxygen bound to the first seat, it becomes easier for oxygen to get bound to the second seat, which in turn makes it easier for oxygen to bind to the third seat and even easier again for oxygen to bind to the fourth. So we get this increased affinity for oxygen the more places on the hemoglobin we see bound. Now at this point we would say that our hemoglobin is saturated. All four seats, all four binding sites for oxygen are occupied by oxygen molecules and as we fill those seats that affinity gets increased. We call this positive cooperativity. The fact that with every oxygen bound, it becomes easier to bind another oxygen is called positive cooperativity. And it's that positive cooperativity that gives us what we call our oxygen dissociation curve. Because the binding of oxygen to this hemoglobin is not perfectly linear. The positive cooperativity is what results in this curved base line. Now, this line is what's going to dictate how oxygen is picked up and dropped off at the lungs and the tissues, respectively. At this point in the curve, is where we see the lung tissues. High partial pressures of oxygen driving that affinity for binding onto the hemoglobin. Down here where we see the steeper portions of the curve where the affinity starts to drop down is going to be the part of the, the curve that's going to represent the tissues. Because we want, if we're going to bind oxygen to the hemoglobin at the lungs, we want to be able to unbind it at the tissues so that the cells can actually take it and use it. 
for reference sake, we can look at a point where oxygen saturation is about 50%. And if we look down at our horizontal line, we can see that at least based on this diagram, the partial pressure of oxygen required to saturate blood at 50% is just short of 30 millimeters per mercury. It's actually somewhere around 26.6. Because of the scale of the diagram, no big deal. We call this our P50. That is the partial pressure of oxygen needed to maintain a 50% saturation of the blood. Now, it's important to realize that this line can shift, so to speak. And if it shifts, it changes the partial pressures needed to maintain this P50 or any saturation that the blood happens to have. Now we have certain criteria that are going to reflect if the curve shifts left or right and which direction it happens to shift in. Now you'll see on a lot of these diagrams this sort of, of information listed. But there's a very easy acronym we can use that uses some of that information. The first is carbon dioxide levels. Increased carbon dioxide levels. Second, increased acidity levels. Now, that also refers to a, 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 a an increase in hydrogen ions or a decrease in pH, because remember that pH scale is inverse. So increased acidity. An increase in 2,3-diphosphoglycerate. You also see that referred to as 2,3-bisphosphoglycerate as a metabolic byproduct. We're recruiting the D out of there. Exercise will shift that curve to the right. And temperature. Now, you'll see a lot of these start to go together. Remember, we've been talking about this for a long time now, about looking at these models as a feedback mechanism. So obviously, if you start to exercise, you are going to increase your carbon dioxide levels. You are going to change your acidity. You are going to increase your 2,3-diphosphoglycerate, and you're going to increase body temperature. So all of these variables do kind of run part and parcel with each other. But if you look at the acronyms here, we have carbon dioxide, C, acidity, A. We take the D from the diphosphoglycerate, E, and T. And we get a nice acronym of cadet, base, right. An increase in carbon dioxide, an increase in the acidity, an increase in the diphosphoglycerate, an increase in the exercise, and or an increase in temperature will all cause this curve to shift to the right. Now, what consequence does that have on oxygenation? Well, if we shift to the right, let's look at something very dramatic, just for illustration purposes. Now, if we draw the same sort of line across here, our 50% oxygenation mark. Now, if we want to maintain a 50% saturation, now look at the oxygen partial pressures. We are going to need to maintain that. So by shifting the diagram to the right, it decreased the affinity for oxygen. So at times when carbon dioxide is elevated, at times when we are undergoing high temperatures, at times we are undergoing more, that's going to be indicators of increased metabolism in the tissues. 
reflecting that that tissues need more oxygen. So shifting this curve to the right, what we observe is an increase ability to kick that oxygen off of the hemoglobin sites so that they can be taken up across the capillary membrane and used up by the tissue. It increases the efficiency of moving oxygen from the blood and into the tissues. Now carbon dioxide is a little bit different and we'll be handling some of this carbon dioxide in a completely different uh, different topic. But basically about 75% of all carbon dioxide is bound to hemoglobin. So you picture this hemoglobin molecule at the tissue level that just lost oxygen from its binding sites. Now, carbon dioxide takes its place. Hemoglobin can bind to other gases. Carbon monoxide can bind to hemoglobin. As a matter of fact, carbon monoxide binds the hemoglobin very, very well. So well that it becomes difficult for oxygen to kick it off of there. So if you are in an environment where you are breathing in this carbon monoxide, you may have an increased problem, even when you remove yourself from that situation, of being able to transport oxygen through the blood because the hemoglobin's all taken up. So what you see in a situation like that, as far as treatment goes, that person may be put in a in a, a hyperbaric chamber with increased oxygen. So now the partial pressure of oxygen is more than what you would typically breathe in from the atmosphere. It's taken up to a whole new level at concentrations or partial pressures great enough to dislodge the carbon monoxide. We do see some carbon dioxide dissolved in the blood solutions, the plasma. Carbon dioxide is a little more soluble than oxygen. But we also see a significant amount of carbon dioxide as part of our buffered system. Now, a buffer, if you recall from AMP1, is a chemical system meant to stabilize blood pH. If a buffer is part of a solution, and we add a strong acid to, to the solution, we wind up stabilizing any effects the strong acid would have had on our, our final pH. Same goes with if we added a strong base. The buffer for the blood is our carbonic acid sodium bicarbonate buffer system. And carbonic acid can break down into carbon dioxide and water so when we look at the chemical equilibrium of that buffer, we can see how carbon dioxide of reserve can be in that buffer system to help regulate blood pH. But again, we will tackle this at a whole new topic once we get to uh, buffers. So it's important to understand gas exchange at the lungs as well as at the tissues and how Dalton's law comes into play there. You need to understand how these gases get transported through the blood. And then finally, how the oxygen hemoglobin dissociation curve reflects the ability for hemoglobin to bind to oxygen at the lungs and drop it off at the tissues. Thank you.